37. He is our all. Think of the closer than breathing bone of his bones, Ephesians 5.30, the closer than breathing bone of his bones relationship of life that we have with the very creator, the sustainer of the universe. Although he is seated in glory at the Father's right hand, he isn't far off. His life is in us where we are, and our life is in him where he is. Absolute oneness. He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit with him. We read in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 17. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Now in Christ Jesus ye who were once far off are made nigh. Ephesians 2 verses 10 and 13. So Jesus is our head. He is our intercessor. He is our life. First, he is our head. When we see Jesus Christ as the sovereign Lord of the universe, we acknowledge him to be ruler of our personal lives and our circumstances. He is our head. We are his body on earth. Our Father hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Ephesians 1 verses 22 and 23. And in Colossians 1 verses 18 and 19 we read this. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, in that in all things he might have the preeminence for it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. He is also our intercessor. The better we know the Lord Jesus in his glory, the more fully we depend upon him as our personal intercessor. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Hebrews 7 verse 25. And in Romans 8 verses 33 and 34 we read the following. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yes rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. When the believer sins, his relationship to the Father isn't affected, but his fellowship with him is impaired. It is for this self-induced exigency that we need the Lord Jesus at the Father's right hand as our advocate and as our intercessor. He is Jesus Christ the righteous. He is our defender in heaven against the accusations of the adversary. Since we have been made the righteousness of God in him, 2 Corinthians 5.21, he justly and continually clears us from all charges. And because, as we read in 1 Corinthians 1.30, and because he of God is made unto us righteousness, he is never our prosecutor. When we fail to confess our sins or to judge ourselves in the matter of sin, we must be chastened. When our father's child training is applied, it is always well deserved and for our good. Our Lord Jesus bore all the wrath against sin on the cross Therefore we grow by means of the chastening. In Hebrews 2.11 we read the following. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness 
unto them which are exercised thereby. There are many Christians who feel that confession of sin is unnecessary. They reason that if their sins are already fully forgiven, why bother to confess them? It is true that we need not ask for forgiveness when we sin. Rather, we are free to thank him for that forgiveness provided at Calvary and received in Christ. But it is necessary to honestly confess our sins, thus siding with him against ourselves. Else, how can we enjoy true fellowship with the one who is holy and hates sin perfectly? The primary ministry of the Holy Spirit is to reveal to us the Lord Jesus as our new life and to occupy our minds and hearts with him. When we step down into the old life and consequently to sin, the Spirit is grieved and must occupy us with ourselves until our honest confession of sin to the Father brings restoration of fellowship. Yes, frank and intimate confession of sin is vital. Think for a moment of someone who observes a loved one sinning against him. Wounded but ever loving, he forgives and says nothing. Meanwhile, the loved one although knowing there is forgiveness, does not confess his sins. Forgiveness is there. Love is waiting. But now, where is the fellowship and integrity in this relationship? But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, not him, and the truth isn't in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1 verses 7 to 9. And finally, he is our life. By now we should be seeing more clearly the wonderful truths concerning the fact that the Lord of glory is our life and that we are as individuals new creations in him. There is but one place, one position where we are to abide and that is in him where he is. The resources and motivations of our daily lives are in the Son who is seated at the right hand of the Father. The expression of our new lives here is the indwelling life of Jesus manifested in our mortal flesh. Our position and our resources as new creations are certainly not in the old man. Our death on the cross now and forever separates us from that reign of sin and we are free to reckon on that fact. Our mind does not have to dwell on and become involved with the indwelling sinful nature. Death is there, but life is in the Lord Jesus. We are looking in the wrong direction when we dwell on the old man and are pulled down in depression and defeat by its sinfulness. Or conversely, consider that nature to be quite harmless and good. We have to slip past the cross and violate our identification with him in his death to sin in order to traffic in that realm. Paul asks in Romans 6 verse 2, How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Our position as new creations is not in this sin-cursed world. We are travelling through it but not abiding in it. How is it that the growing believer can rest and be at peace in the midst of this world of death, free to hold forth and share the word of life? It is simply because his anchorage and source of life is in another person in another world. Keep looking down from above. The death of the 
cross stands not only between us and the old nature, but also between us and this world system. In Galatians 6 verse 14 we read this, But may it never be that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. There is nothing here for us to rely on. There is everything there for us to depend on. On earth, death. In glory, life. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, it is much more certain now that we are reconciled that we shall be saved, daily delivered from sin's dominion through him and his resurrection life. Romans 5 verse 10 If today the roots of your life are in the old nature and therefore in the world, absorbing the poison and death of those cross-condemned sources, it's time to move. There is a quiet and a restful abiding place just where our Father has positioned us. Our communion is with the Father and the Son where they are. Is it not time to hide from the old by hiding in the new? In that attitude of faith and walk of fellowship, our Lord Jesus will have another life through which to reach and replenish others. Therefore, as we read in 1 Peter 4 verse 11, Therefore, if anyone preaches, let it be as uttering God's truth. If anyone renders a service to others, let it be in the strength which God supplies, so that in everything glory may be given to God in the name of Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the might to the ages of the ages. Amen. Fellowship with the old life results in nothing but sin and chastening. Fellowship with the Lord Jesus results in love and life for others. 38. That I may know him. Our object in sharing these truths of the word is that we may be turned from all that God condemned to a deep personal knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Truth can be very impersonal and ineffective if its ultimate purpose is not realised. What we need is the Spirit's application of the full-orbed work of the cross. This will enable us to avoid the sin within and without and to give our complete attention and love to the Lord Jesus. Anything short of this will satisfy neither him nor the hungry heart. We must remember that it is by learning to know the Lord Jesus that we know the Father. Have I been such a long time with you? And ye hast not known me, he said. He that hath seen me has seen the Father. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. John chapter 14, verses 9 and 11. We are not to know the Lord Jesus in order to emulate him as our example. Rather, we are to behold him in the word and allow the Spirit of God to conform us to his image. Not imitation, but conformation. If we flounder in the old man and pay attention to his clamourings, the hateful works of the flesh will inevitably be manifested for all to see and suffer from. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, Learn of me in Matthew eleven twenty nine. His infinite glory must not discourage us from pursuing our privilege of knowing him intimately. His divine majesty is unfolded in order to display his divine mercy. To encourage the reader's further study, 
let us behold him from several different viewpoints. First, let us view him and his life as creator. The word sets forth Christ as he was prior to his humiliation here on earth in the glory that he had with his Father before the world was. We see this in John 17, verse 5. There he is seen as the creator in one aspect of his life. God does nothing directly, but all through his Son and by his Spirit. That is why it was in the Lord Jesus that he created us anew. For by him, for by Christ, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. Colossians 1 verse 6. Thus we can come to know him as creator. Next, we can know him in his life on earth. The fruit of the Spirit is developed in us as we behold him in his earthly walk and work. For actual growth, there is to be an entering into his life via the word, feeding on him, appropriating him. First, Consider the Lord Jesus as he lovingly shares his life with the up-and-out religious leader Nicodemus and the down-and-out woman of Samaria. Listen closely to him. Observe his tender concern for these individuals who represent the extremities of this spectrum of human need. Oh, note how faithfully and effectively he applies the truth of their hungry hearts, not by method, but by nature. A ministry of life. Study John chapter 2, verses 23 to chapter 3, verse 21. And study chapter 4, verse 5 to 26. Secondly, pay close attention to him as he calls his first four disciples. And especially note the way that he ministers to Peter. Oh, study Luke chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Spend time with him as he shares and applies his wonderful parables by the sea. Study Matthew 13, 1 to 58 and enter into his restful attitude as he in turn gives rest to the tossing tempest and the tempest tossed. Study Mark 4.35 to chapter 4 verse 1. Third, stand with him as he commissions the twelve. Observe him. Listen to what he shares with them. Study Matthew chapter 9 verse 36 to chapter 11 verse 1. All of this teaches us who he is and what he is like. Feed on him as he feeds the 4,000 and hear him reveal himself as the bread of life. Study Mark 8 verses 1 to 9 and John 6 22 to chapter 7 verse 1. And fourth, how touchingly his character is depicted in his parable of the Good Samaritan. Study Luke 10, 25 to 37. And nowhere is he more explicitly manifested to us than in his fellowship in the Bethany home. Oh, study Luke 10, 38 to 42. And John 11, 1 to 46. And what of his humble and yet majestic service to the twelve during the Last Supper? How his love is drawn out to him there. Study Luke 22, 7 to 30. Oh, these are but a few of the specific instances in the word by which we can come to know him more intimately.
And thus we realise something of the life the Holy Spirit is developing within our hungry hearts. And then look at his life in glory. The Holy Spirit doesn't limit us to the earthly, nor to the earthly life of the Lord Jesus. Knowing him in his humility is preparation for knowing him in his glory. Remember the Lord Jesus' prayer. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory. John 17, 24. We are to behold him as he was and know him as he is so that we may be like him here and now. We come to know him as he is from the vantage point of our position in him at the Father's right hand and this ever by means of the word. Our Father hath raised us up together with him and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2 verse 6 By intelligent and confident faith we are to abide above in our life source. We read in Colossians 1 verses 1 to 3 the following. If then you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above, where Christ is, seated on the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on the things that are on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. As we behold his glory there, we are conformed to his humility here. So that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 11 Abide above to grow below. The Lord Jesus set the pattern. He that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. John 3, 13. It is true that the source of our Christian life is in his glory. But that aspect of our lives will not be revealed until his appearing. The glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, says Jesus, in John 17, 22. And when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Colossians 3, verse 4. First, humility. Then, glory. First, the cross. Then the crown. Is it not worth waiting for? We are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Romans 8, 17-19 Oh, what a comfort as we study to know him better in his glory. To be assured that the Father will honour Paul's faithful intercession on behalf of each of us. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Ephesians 1 verses 17 and 18. Ask yourself the question, whose inheritance, the inheritance of the saints. And we look at his life as ruler and sustainer. For not only did our Lord Jesus create 
and redeem, but he ever upholds that which is his. Not only is he the sustainer of the universe that he created, but he also coordinates and directs all within the realm and to the consummation of his father's eternal purposes, and that includes each of his own. We read in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 to 3, the following. God hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who, being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he hath himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. The late Dr. William Graham Scroggley made this observation that gives us further reason for rejoicing in the Lord Jesus and having no confidence in the flesh. Philippians 3 verse 3 as follows. He said, our understanding of nature and our interpretation of history are both partial and faulty. Yet, if we are Christians at all, we must believe that back of the both of them is the divine thinker, the infinite wisdom, the almighty power, who is the Son of God, our Redeemer and our life. Things have not been started and then left to run on their own material or moral momentum. But all things are under the constant control of the divine creator, in whom all things have their centre of unity, who appoints to everything its place, who determines the relations of things to one another, and who combines all into an ordered whole so that the universe is a cosmos and not chaos. It is not law ultimately which rules this universe, but God, our Father, and he rules it through his Son, our Saviour. Human history is not in the grip of fate, but is in the hands of him who was pierced for us, on Calvary. And finally we look at his life, our ground of growth. The ground of the first Adam is that into which we were born and in which we grew. It is there that the world, the flesh and the devil would keep us bondage. It is the ground of carnality, of sin and death off-limits to the new creation in Christ. The ground of the last Adam is that into which we have been reborn and are to abide. It is there that the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit would have us grow and mature. It is the ground of spirituality, righteousness and life. The Father's one abiding place for the believer. As we take our rightful stand on the resurrection side of the cross, setting our minds and hearts on the Lord Jesus by the word, the Holy Spirit will establish us in him above. On that ground of growth, we will grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and for ever. Amen. 2 Peter 3, verse 18. And finally, 39, Summation. The following quotation from a message by Norman F. Doughty seems to sum up what we have been seeking to share. When we say that Christ's life has come into us to displace ours, what do we mean? We do not mean that this life of the Lord Jesus has come in to displace our personality. When I speak of our fallen life, 
I do not mean the human personality as such. I mean the poison which permeates our personality, the poison of sin which has degraded and defiled and distorted our humanity. It is not that this new life of the Lord Jesus comes in to take the place of our personality, to take the place of our faculties created by God, but it comes in to take the place of the sinful life which is operating in our personality and employing our faculties. The vessel is the same, but the contents are different. The same vessel, the same person, the same faculties, but the contents different. No longer this sinful element, but the very holy nature of the Lord Jesus Christ, filling, interpenetrating, permeating. Our Father is not seeking to abolish us as human beings and have the Lord Jesus replace us. He is seeking to restore us as human personalities so that we may be the vehicle through which Christ will express himself. Therefore you find that whenever God gets hold of a man, instead of abolishing his personality, he makes it what he intended it to be. Redemption is the recovery of the man, not the destruction of the man. And when the Lord Jesus in us is brought to the place he is aiming for, there will not be an atom of the old life left, but the man will be left, glorified in union with the Lord Jesus Christ.